Right, good evening everybody. Sorry we're just uh, a couple of minutes late. Um, welcome on a very cold evening, so thank you all for, for coming along. The good news is we're only four months away from the start of the season and we can all get out and uh, enjoy Hove and some sunshine, hopefully. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Adrian Harms. Uh, I do the cricket commentary for BBC Radio Sussex and it's also the commentary that goes uh, around the ground as well. So. Um, I know some of you, and I've seen some of the messages and the questions we've got for tonight, so it'd be good to catch up with some of you uh, after the event as well. Uh, my role here today is an independent person. I'm not working for the BBC tonight. I'm independent to ensure fair play. Uh, so that means um, if Ian and James don't answer the questions as fully as you expect, then we'll perhaps press them a little harder. But also, if the questions are unreasonable, then we'll, we'll point those out as well. But the idea is... Um, and I've spoken to Ian and James, nothing is out of bounds today. This is, this is a cricket forum. It's about what goes on out there. So if you're here tonight thinking, well, um, what about the price of membership? What about the price of T20 tickets? What about the choice of sandwiches in Greg's or whatever? Those things are not relevant for tonight. And uh, they'll be relevant for another occasion with Bob or Rob or somebody else. But, 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 but not me. Um, so this is all about cricket, so cricket questions are what we're uh, all about. Um, we have got a number of people who have uh, sent in questions, and I think there's a number of people in the room uh, who are here who have got questions as well. So we work through the list, there may be a bit of an overlap of questions, but we'll try to get to all the questions that we can. Uh, there's no time limit, I understand, so we can chatter away uh, as long as we like. And the main thing tonight, I think what Ian and James want to get out of this evening is that everybody goes away without any doubt in their mind. Nobody goes away thinking, actually, I wish I'd asked that question. Um, so I'll say, nothing is off limits. The questions are to be answered uh, and to be asked. So please don't feel you're going away with any uncertainty uh, looking ahead to uh, next season. Um, when you do ask a question, just stick your hand up and Sam Keir, the press officer, will be running around. There he is, waving away uh, with his microphone. Just introduce yourself, your name, and then we'll go from there and we'll put the, the, the question to the... The relevant person. Um, so without further ado, um, it's time to introduce our guests, um, or our coaches I should say, and they need no introduction really. The man to my right, uh, Robert James Kirtley, who I'm delighted to say, and I think a round of applause, has just become a dad again. So well done James. Thank you. Um, just a small matter of 614 first class wickets. A member of the championship winning side in 2003, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, test match debut in 2003. I was going to ask you about that, actually, James. Um, uh, six uh, wickets against South Africa at Trent Bridge. That must have been right. Was there any of those wickets that you remember in particular with, with great relish? Oh, you, you remember your test matches. Um, I've only got to worry about four of them, so I'm quite lucky. But... Um, Graham Smith was the real thorn in the side of England at the time, and I managed to get a very lucky LBW on this occasion. But it, um, Trent Bridge was always a really great hunting ground for me, and I think you know, the ball always moved, so I always felt confident. Uh, but it was a special place. But, yeah, Graham Smith, that's, that was the one. That was the big wicket of the time. And it was, yeah, um, it was an interesting period of English cricket. You know, just a transition from the old guard to the new guard to when they put that 2005 Ashes side together. Mm. And on the first day, what were those like, those, those first day nerves? I, I only got told early on, on on that morning. I only probably had about half an hour to worry about it, if I'm honest. And thankfully, we batted first. So really, I got to ease my way into the, into the game. But it, I was asked recently actually and it, it just everything travels so much quicker just the day travels quicker all the action travels quicker um and you are it's just having that ability i think or that mindset just to take yourself down a little bit um and interesting troy cooley was a bowling coach at the time and i just saw an article recently that england have looked to to get his uh, help and advice in the, the build-up to this Ashes series. So um, he was very good at preparing uh, those bowlers at, at that time, and it's good to see him doing it again. Yeah, and working with Ollie Robertson, which will be great. Um, the other thing, and uh, we'll come to Ian in a minute, but that, that five for 27 in the 
CNG final at Lords, 2006. Special memory? Special memory, another couple of lucky LBWs, I have to say. <laughs> so, uh, same umpire? <laughs> yeah. Um, Stuart Law still, you know, even playing against, uh, when we played against him in the last game of the season, he still can't let it go. So, um, he were, the umpires were, yeah, they were good to us that day, but it was um, a culmination, actually, of a side that had built from some probably some testing times in the back end of the late 90s uh, to understanding, having confidence in one another, a togetherness, uh, an empathy to one another and enjoying each other's success, which um, I don't think it will be the last time you hear about how a side might be built, but that was sort of culminating with a championship win in 2003 uh, a double win in 2006 and subsequent uh, doubles in one day trophies. So the sort of building, being around, understanding some of the trials and tribulations, that m the blood, sweat and tears, as it were, that sort of went in before to those champagne moments that you never forget, although the champagne that we did consume that night does every bit uh, of damage. It... it to, to help you try and forget those, but you can't. You can't forget it because you can't forget the journey um, and the, the journey that you had with those very, that very special team, that very special players, but a, what was ultimately a very special journey. So four test matches to my right, uh, 15 test matches uh, to my left, um, 884 first-class wickets. We'll ask which of those 884 in... Uh, enjoyed the most, but also I was interested in three first-class centuries as well, so um, you must have enjoyed those. Yeah, that's, that's what the stats say. So, um, Ian Salisbury, uh, good to see you. So just, just talk a little bit about those 884. Any, any in particular that stand out you think, yeah, I was glad to get him? Uh, oh, firstly, good evening, everybody. Ladies, gentlemen, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. I probably have to explain, this is not normal facial hair that me and James have. <laughs> um, it does feel as though people are sort of looking at us sometimes a little bit closer than normal. Um, obviously, you heard of Movember. Um, we're hopefully raising some money for some really good male causes for mental and physical health. So um, it, I think it was on our website, actually, if anybody wanted to donate. But um, we don't normally look like this all winter. That is, uh, it's not something we, I know James is under serious pressure from wife to get rid of his. Um, so... She was having a go at me the other day when I met little Naya for the first time. My little goddaughter, actually, just to let you... My proud moment. Um, so, what was the question? Uh, sorry, yeah. Stop playing for um, time. I'm not playing for time. 884, I don't know, really. Probably, um, ironically, because I'm older now than James, that I probably remember my last one, actually, because it's the easiest one to remember, and... Obviously, I had my time here, which we'll probably come on to at some stage, and then I had my time at uh, Surrey. And then it didn't quite end how I wanted to, and then my last game for Warwickshire, um, I, I limped off at Surrey because I was old and my body was falling apart, but I did some things to play again. So you don't always get the fairy tale ending in cricket, how you want things to end. And luckily for me in uh, Warwickshire, um, I think I took the most fifers that year in the country. I was the leading T20 bowler. And my last ball actually in first class cricket was a wicket. So sometimes you can. And then literally in my last game, I didn't bowl a ball. And sometimes that can happen to spinners in this country. But it was actually one of Chris Wokes' first games for Warwickshire. He took 13 wickets in a game I didn't bowl a ball. And so my last wicket was a guy... <laughs> called uh, Palladino at Essex. <laughs> and so it's not salubrious or anything like that, but it was court slip. I took six for, and we got promoted at that time for Warwickshire. And then if we talk about my last shot, I was caught deep extra cover off a left arm seamer. <laughs> so that was not salubrious, but sometimes to end the right way. So I always know that my last ball in first class cricket was a wicket. I, Paladino is not as good as I would like to be. Ravi was in there, uh, Tender Shot, uh, a few others, but Pal I'm afraid it's Paladino. <laughs> Sounds okay to me. Um, so there we are, 
two guys who have played cricket for the county, best part of 1,500 uh, first-class wickets between them, three first-class centuries. Um, it's your chance to answer your question. Don't let tonight go by and go home and think, I didn't ask that question I really wanted to ask. Nothing is off limits. But we're going to start this evening. Ian and James are going to give a short presentation, about 10 minutes worth, before we go to questions, about just an overview of their strategy going forward. So, over to you, Look, fellas. James will do a lot of presenting because he's te more technically... Ah advanced than I am. It's an age thing. We didn't even have computers at school or anything like this, so James just knows how to work a clicker and I don't. If I have any problems, luckily we've got an analyst as well, and James. And when we went for the role, more importantly, every decision that we make during the season, this will become apparent during the evening, we put together a strategy for the next five years because we wanted to make sure either going through ourselves, and there's a, I don't mind, people say, there's a Sussex Performance Committee that's in place for a reason. And there's five or six people on that, including CEO, chairman, which I'm grateful, I'm slightly worried actually, there's some big wigs here this evening, they're worried about what we're gonna say. I'm looking around, <laughs> slightly worried. And, but we, this committee is massively important, and they make decisions of everything that happens at Sussex with the cricket inside. And we, as coaches, are invited onto that committee. So any decision that's made has to go through this committee. So you have to have a strategy in place of where you're going to and where you want to get to because it takes time and you have to make decisions against it. And that will become apparent. I'm sure with questions of why we did this or why I did this, but we'll always come back to this strategy and where we want to go because we believe in it. And as Rob pointed out to me earlier, you probably come in today and you've seen the flats now appearing down the bottom. It took three years for a hole in the ground. All of a sudden now it's growing, but that can take time. It's taken three years, did you say, about to just get to the stage and it's now gonna fly. And if you think there and now think there, this is now the most important thing. We want this to fly at the same rate but you have to put in the time and make sure you get the strategy right for that to happen. And this is, a lot of questions will be around where we, how we get to these. It, it's not all the answers because you can't put a hundred page strategy, you'll be bored. But literally this is what we came up with and what we delivered and hopefully why we were entrusted for this period of time to do what we're doing. So it's really important We'll answer questions straight after, obviously, about the strategy, but it, this, is, <coughs> this is where all our decisions come from, just to make that clear. Okay, off we go, James. So, uh, James, um, just for the people watching at home, would you be okay sitting in front of the mic because they won't be able to hear you otherwise? If you can still... Yeah, okay, I will do that, no worries, Sam. Um, I think it was, this idea was born out of talking to loads of people at a time where we knew that Dizzy was leaving. Um, we saw an important winter. We'd seen a transition with um, a load of young players coming into the side and impressing. And actually, most importantly, it was what they did beforehand that was so impressive in our preparations. You know, COVID is going to get labelled for a lot of things and, you know, an, an awful lot of bad. But... For us, it, it gave opportunity. And, you know, we sat down at the end of the season and we sort of came up with, um, there were some elements that we really thought were important that were going to provide a real basis for what we were going to be. And so we had a chat with Rob and Keith and these were the three big things that came out from our conversation. And it, it really did resonate. And it suddenly became really clear and what we thought was, it's never simple, but it became clear about what we were going to try and do. And those three words at the bottom, strategy, culture and clarity, were just continually repeated and we, we started to get an understanding of it all. And so what did it look like? We wanted sustained success. Now there are two trophies. You've got the championship and you've got the, the T20. But what we wanted to be... Uh, really careful about is that we didn't want it to limit success. So hence, 
That's why, you know, we got to finals day. We didn't have the finals day that we wanted this year. And it's important to emphasize that this was prepared, this presentation, and I haven't changed it for 13 months because I wanted to make sure that there was no sort of hindsight or uh, any sort of additions. So this is what we had come up with. The other thing was we wanted five England players. We wanted to see five England players debut. Salty and Robbo. These were our predictions. This is what we wanted. We didn't know who the other three might be. We knew CJ was playing and it was great to see Tamal back in the fold. George Garton, all but for COVID, probably would have had a debut this summer. Jack Carson playing for the first class counties representative side. But equally important was the three young players that all got to play for the Young Lions this summer. And I, I, I would challenge probably, I don't know that Sussex have probably had any more England representatives uh, in a year than we probably had this year. But as I say, this was uh, a presentation uh, developed, as I say, about 14 months ago. So again, we go back to those three words, but this was the part that we had to do. This is the bit we had to get right. We had to get it right through the, the opportunities that we were going to give these players. And sometimes you, you try and plan, you try and make it safe. Uh, it doesn't always go to, to plan. It was probably easier in, in 2020 to give opportunity than it was in 2021 with the environment of, of more senior players, but we made decisions going through the season. And then we opened it up to coaches, to some of the senior players, about what culture meant. And, you know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to read out, you can read it all for yourselves, because, you know, many of us have sort of endured those death by PowerPoint moments. But there were some very important messages that had come out from what we thought the culture was going to be. But there were going to be no good if the players weren't going to take ownership of this. And we, you'll see that we are investing in those young players. We're investing in the players that we think have those behaviours. Because we believe it's so important to deliver what we want to deliver over the next few years. The structure. Again, it doesn't say um, we wanted to understand where the head coaches sat, where were the line management. We wanted clarity in everything that was going on. Because if we had clarity in all these areas, then we could be accountable. And this is where probably Sauls and I tonight are, um, maybe foolishly, I hope not, but we want to be transparent. We, we are prepared that you know, decisions that we're making since our appointment, we are accountable. Of course we're accountable. There's some things we can't control. But ultimately, if, we've got, if we're sure of where all these um, areas sit, then we can actually be accountable for them. Again, with the strategy, what, what is it going to take for us to deliver these? So the leadership from, from Rob all the way down, from the chairman, all the way down the, squad, uh, the club, we also realised we had some highly talented individuals. <clears throat> and I'm trying to think of uh, a really good example of Ashley Wright, actually. Um, assistant batting coach, but has actually studied human movement and was an SNC coach. So his understanding of how the body moves, how you can hit the ball more effectively isn't done by some sort of lucky knack or charm. He's actually studied human movement. You know, we've got other players that um, Souls has done a, uh, a study on uh, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Plasticity Program. Is that right? There you go. But it, it's all understanding, language. Um, you know, we've got some really talented individuals. Also in recruitment, massively important with Mike Yardy who's just about to complete his psychology masters masters yeah and it's really important to him that he continues to study that while he's with us but also practice that we we honestly believe he is the next or 
you know, normally you'll have a coach that says, I could have spin skills or fast bowling skills. We're going to have a coach on our staff that's got psychology. He'll be the first, unless you can come up with anybody knows anybody else in the world who's come up with something like that. That's unbelievable skill to have because he believes in, often psychology is used to fix people. And I, I've seen a therapist, I don't mind admitting that, but he's trying to fix something. He massively believes in creating foundations rather than fixing people. So you don't have to fix people. So he's now, it was crucial and an amazing appointment that he's come back to the club. But with psychology being a massive part of that. And that's not just with the academy. Because you could argue, we've got a whole brand new academy, sorry to interrupt, this year because the whole of the last academy are now signed. So we had to get a whole new cohort, which is hugely exciting, but it doesn't mean, say, a Mike Yardy in coach stroke psychologist will not be working with our young players that are on the staff. And it's massively important, as it was massively important for us to have the first female that's ever worked in the male game, coaching. She brings so much more than just keeping skills. It, it's crucial in identifying people who are hugely talented but they can do other things. Sorry, that was just highlighting other people. My additional skill is I can work the clicker, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well, James. And I think the players, again, we wanted to get make sure that they got the role clarity and the, the recruitment of players was going to be vital because we had to identify not just the performers, but also the right characters that we wanted around this young group of talented cricketers that we had. But again, it had to be made on this decision-making process. So again, we wanted to have the word clarity again, how we were going to play. We knew that spin was going to be an emphasis, for example. We could see the emergence of these young spinners. We knew we had to play on really good pitches. These are all things that we wanted to implicate. We have to look at succession. You know, we're, we're looking to plan for four or five years in advance. You know, a player like Jamie Atkins, it's going to take time. We've seen some incredible performances from a player like him, from Henry Crocombe, the <clears throat> emergence of Sean Hunt. Even for the young spinners, it will take a toy on their bodies. So to be able to give them um, the game time, but in the same time, time to rest and recover is vitally important. Again, giving the players accountability, so their individual development plans. These are all things that will have been in place, have become very much in the forefront of the, the players' uh, you know, we've just gone through all the appraisals again to make sure they're 100% clear on what they're going to work on this winter. And again, we, we can't be... We can't just assume that they've got one role. You know, I think one of the more exciting days, and I know it was Sewell's is one of the most favourite, probably, uh, weirdly, the games. But one of the moments of seeing Jack Carson and Henry Croke and wrestle the momentum away and nearly changed the course of the game against North Hans in that championship game here. You know, to see two young players who are obviously more than capable with the bat, for us to ignore that would be very dangerous. So to recognise that they have other roles and to see them play, to see them play with a, uh, a desire to try and change things, a, a resilience that I think for a 20-year-old and a 19-year-old was so impressive to see. Um, we have to give attention to these areas and that's what drove the winter. So bear in mind, go back forward. Yes, go on. Sorry, James. No, I don't have, what is this Gantt chart? The Gantt chart is... In brief, it's, it's looking at the three or four years of how many games... We think certain players will need to have played. Um, Eddie Jones will talk about how many games you'll have to play before he thinks that they're ready to play in a successful side. 
It's how many, where the strengths and the weaknesses, where all these things that we are compiling, all the evidence from the data that we're getting, whether it's from the academy, all these areas, we are putting into one big uh, centralised information point that allows us to make informed decisions so that we know. And I know it's disappointing sometimes that we, you, we might not be able to field sometimes the side that you think we should do, but actually there is method in our madness. That, you know, if we keep flogging a Jamie Atkins, we're going to break him. If we keep flogging um, a George Garton, we're going to break him. And so we have to carefully manage these guys and we've got to understand what that looks like all the way through the schedule of their winters. You know, George is a fine example. Just gone off to the big bash, might be picked up into the IPL. What dilemmas does that provide us whenever the IPL auction is end of January? Could send up a whole lot of um, questions, probably ones that we can't answer, but you know, ones that we don't know until the time. But we have to, um, we have to be aware of them. But on that, but if he doesn't get picked up and he's been playing, uh, how do we get his overs up and his workload up with the red ball to make sure that when he does play <coughs> red ball, he doesn't break? <coughs> it's as simple as that. Or you look at a Jack Carson, how many wickets do we predict he can take? So in his first year, we were predicting he'd play four games, 10 wickets, 100 runs. This year, we were hoping he would double, he would go to 30 wickets, 300 runs. Ironically, he took 37 wickets, 380 runs. But where the succession is, the overs, we hope he takes 40 wickets and 400 runs, followed by 50 and 500. But we have to work, his, work out where his body's at, his maturation of his body with the medical department. There's so much research in all this. It's not just what well, I'd say old school, you just got a bowl or whatever. You know, it's a guy who's got tendinopathy in his right knee that we have to manage. That's why I didn't play any white ball cricket this year. So we have to manage his workloads because we want him to go 10 wickets, 30 wickets, 40 wickets, 50 wickets. Because if, when you get to 50 wickets and 500 runs, that ties in with 2024, potentially when an Atkins has gone 20, 30, 40. Uh, Crocombe's done the same thing if we've looked after them. And that side will be ready to perform altogether. But there's a lot of research that goes into that. Not by us, by the way. There's a lot... <laughs> cleverer people than us that arrange and do that sort of thing. But we have to be aware of that. It's just not how you pick a side. How many games can they play in a row? At what age? But also, somebody's body can be very different from another person's body. Young Archie Lennon is not going on the under-19 trip to West Indies because he's got a historic potential stress fracture we have to look after. He hasn't had back pain for a year and a half but a scan because he's scanned and he's got a calcium defect so he's on tablets etc because we care about these people we care about these kids they are looked after so well but not just in the obvious way are you okay there's they're scanned our medical department is amazing plus we have to adhere to everything that's going on because we want to get to where we want to get with this side that's Gantt, ultimately. That's where we're going. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. So what we did realise is with this side, and Sauls and I did a present... We did this presentation to the players in November 2020, a year ago, just over a year ago. And then we got locked down again. But this is what we saw we could do in an area. We were a young side. We could be dynamic. And again, these are, these are things that we identify by talking to the coaches, senior players, senior management. And whilst having a work ethic is a non-negotiable, it was making sure that they, they were clear. A lot of the young players needed to know, understand that if they wanted to score hundreds and lots of hundreds, they'd have to bat 200 balls. And Tom Haynes, over the winter, did exactly that. We made sure he hit more balls than anybody else. We made sure our bowlers were able to come back and they would go off in the winter. We were so lucky to have the marquee where we could bring guys back for second and third spells because that's what you do in the summer. 
Tom Haynes was able to bat 200 balls. And again, it's the reason I don't want to change this preparation is because this presentation is because this is what we'd, we'd laid out, is what we wanted to do. But they would have to be fit. Now, we did a lot of the cricket skill last winter because we had the marquee. We didn't have the build-up due to lockdown. But I can assure you at the moment, these guys are, are getting fit so they can fulfil uh, these ideas. And I think there, Adrian, we're done. Great. Maybe the last you hear from me, but okay. otherwise it'd be all right. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Ian. So, uh, ladies and gents, the floor is yours. What, what we'll do for the benefit of people who are watching at home, we, we've got a list of questions that uh, we'll, we'll come to, but we'll take questions from those that are, that are here tonight first. Um, so if, if there's a volunteer who wants to, to open proceedings, put your hand up and Sam will whiz around uh, with the microphone. Kevin, in the front row, thank you. Brave man. Yeah, it's probably a question that's not very current, but I don't think we had a chance to ask, ask this last year because of the circumstances. It's probably something that Bob or Rob will probably have to answer. Um, Luke Wells' contract wasn't renewed last year. Um, we all know he had a good season next year, this year, sorry. I accept the hindsight's a wonderful thing. However, what was the club's thinking? I'm just interested in why Luke wasn't uh, renewed a contract. Okay, I think I think we'll try and keep the answers to to James and, and if we can. But, uh... Look, I think you know this the the decision on Luke was um, obviously before we were in position. I think the club had to understand that there were some financial constraints we had to adhere to, and um, you know it is a business. We have to look at that side of things, and I think at the time and. There were discussions, and as I say, um, that you were looking that, at a player that sadly wasn't performing, as he had done for the previous uh, couple of seasons, few seasons, and was playing one format of the game. And that, that's a very hard... Um, if you're trying to build a business case, that was quite hard to, to support. And I guess that's where we have to look at it. Look, I... I um, Crikey, I, I worked at Beads. Alan Wells was a colleague there. You know, these are these are hard decisions that are made in professional cricket. You know, I, I was as delighted as anyone to see him, A, get 100 at Lancashire uh, and to see him do well. But sometimes as a club and as a business and um, in all those areas, you know, that was a decision that was taken at the time and for those reasons. Yeah, and I mean, just to echo that, obviously... I've known Luke since, well, before he was born. <laughs> um, similarly, and obviously it happened before our time, so we can't totally, but I understand the business side. I think you've seen when we answer a lot of questions, we, we're trying to produce players that can play in all three forms. Um, Luke had had two poor years um, leading up to that. And sometimes, and James probably can't answer it, but I can, is sometimes a change is good. It can reinvigorate you. And sometimes you can become stale at a place that you've been your whole life. And sometimes he, and we're still in touch. Oh, we're still in touch, me and Luke, Alan, the same. We had Alan in this year, came to a couple of sessions with us. And sometimes just the move is the right thing. And I think it worked for him. And... He, a new challenge sometimes can reinvigorate something that you uh, If you looked at his last two years, he averaged 23 and 21, and only playing in one form. For a talented player, sometimes you have to make business decisions. And, you know, if he was still here, maybe Tom Haynes might not have had the season he had. So sometimes in sport, that's what happens. And I moved on, and sometimes it's the right time to move on, it's the wrong time. But again, when we see him here and we'd see him up in Lancashire, we're all still friends. We still speak. We wish him well. We're ple any if anybody moves on, we still want them to do well because they're human beings first and foremost as well. Um, would he have had the season if he'd have stayed? Who knows? We, we can't answer that question, but we wish him well. Obviously, always welcome back here as a cat player and wish him well. I, I think it's a million-dollar question. Was it the right thing or the wrong thing? 
Uh, that was a question that was also asked by David Spurshot and uh, uh, William Knight as well. But gentleman here uh, with his, his hand up. Is, is this a, a follow-up question to Luke Wells? Okay. Hold on to it. Okay. I, I just wanted to say you were talking about the staleness of the player, but of course there's also the issue of the perception of that player by the club management and those making the um, selection decisions at that point because you could turn it around and say that one of the reasons that Luke Wells was only playing one format of the game was because that was all was being offered. That was all that was being offered to him. Whereas now at Lancashire, in his first season there, he has actually played games in the other two formats. And um, I'm sure it was very frustrating for him not to get selected in the other two formats when he was at Sussex. So just as you say that it's in, you know, it's refreshing for the player to change scene. The circumstances that bring that about are sometimes a blinkered perception on the part of the um, uh, those making the decisions. And I'm sure you, Ian, having changed counties a few times, may have experienced that, that you were viewed perhaps differently after a move one, in one county from another. Um, so I just think, I, I just wanted to make that point that really it's not just you can't just look at the stats of the player, you know, if he was never given an opportunity in those other formats. Plus, I think the thing that stuck in a lot of people's throats after the way he was treated last year was that he wasn't given the opportunity to play even one game. Uh, so uh, to judge him based on his historic performance in 2019 and before overlooks the fact that he didn't actually play a single game in 2020. And it's no wonder then he would come out of the blocks somewhat uh, more invigorated to be playing for a county that wanted him, one of the top counties in the country, and actually, you know, ended up somewhat nearer the top of the pile than our county did this year. Sounds like you want to support Lancashire. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I've been a Sussex supporter since 1959. I just it, thought it was really bad the way he was treated. Yeah. That's all. And look, we, we, we obviously can't answer historic stuff so I can only look back obviously um, on his stats over those two years and but what I can answer is obviously yeah you when you move county you can totally reinvent yourself because there is judgment that can that comes when you're at the same place for a long time you, you there's a lot of people have a, a judgment on you and when you go somewhere else you can create a totally new character with no judgment. They might know a little bit about you because they obviously think you can play or whatever. You can totally create a new character. All, all I know, when Luke, when I saw Luke, when I saw him when we Lancashire first came, I've never seen him look fitter or more reinvigorated. Yes. But then that, that's both ways as well. Not, maybe because you didn't feel. But I... Even if I didn't feel wanted, I still have personal pride always in how fit I was and how much I trained and how much I wanted to play. So just, I, I understand everybody wants to feel valued and wanted, of course. But then when you've been in a place for a long time, your numbers can count against you at times and preconceived ideas can obviously come in. Whereas if you go somewhere else, then it's a fresh slate, it's a new chapter. That's just reality but sometimes you have to move to create that because maybe if he stayed where he did those same numbers and same things are still there plus his own hang-ups of why he wasn't there as well sorry sorry i didn't catch your name you were Vincent. But, but, but peter one one point that peter did make uh, both to ian and james was that maybe luke was almost pigeonholed as a championship player and didn't get an opportunity in one day cricket which i know is not down to you you, to you guys but i remember in innings here i think he made 258 against durham and his, his, his final 50 came in about 12 balls or something, and he was smashing the ball out of the ground. Yeah. So you, you sort of think to yourself, perhaps he could play other forms. Is there a danger sometimes that cricketers can... You get to 200 <laughs> before you <laughs> face 12 balls. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it, it, well, I've never had that pleasure. No, but, no, but his, his, his final 50 came about. The point I'm trying to make, sometimes can players get pigeonholed as a championship player? And is that something that you're looking to look at players and think, for example, perhaps Tom Haynes might be a T20 player as well. You, you were talking about people being multi-dimensional cricketers playing yeah. in all formats of the game. Correct, and Tom Haynes started playing his first 50-over cricket So he, when he was captain for that competition. That was his first 50-over game. Again, COVID, circumstances, opportunity. 
The tournament now, 50 over, with loads of people going off to 100, it is a development tournament at the moment. And I don't care what anybody says, that's just factual. Because all the best players from English cricket and around the world is playing in the 100. You have to view it that way. And so, if we had all our players available, would Tom Haynes have played? Who knows? And ironically, if Luke was seen that way, he would have been picked up in 100. So he then gets to play the 50 over more than he would do before. So again, it creates opportunity. But Tom Haynes playing, of course you want to develop, but I know there are players, and that's why there are certain players who play T20, certain people play 50 over. It's very different. You have to strike at 130, 150 in T20 cricket to succeed. There are some people who naturally strike around 180. And, but if they try to strike at 150 or 130, their technique goes and they can't do it. Because it would be boring if everybody could do everything. There's very few players that play. So in the England type, there's very few players that play all three forms. Ironically. Yeah. Joe Root, you would say Joe Root said... Finish that point about Luke Wells. I mean, clearly, I'm sure all of us in this room would regard him as primarily a red ball player. Certainly, that was the way he was. But the way he would play and build an innings on the occasions that he built the innings. Um, and he did that successfully quite a few times. So he, he was clearly, primarily, that was his mindset. But as was indicated by you, Adrian, in that, that phenomenal innings of 250-odd, uh, he did indicate there that he did have another way of playing. And I think he'd proved that in Australian uh, club cricket as well, that he was capable of scoring at some speed. So, um, you know, the overall point is, yes, he was primarily a red ball player, but it's interesting that at another county, you know, a uh, pretty substantial, successful county most of the time, they, they have already viewed him as a potential player in the white ball format. The Look, I think the, the 50 over bit is, I think, something that we, he would have played 50 over cricket, obviously, here. Uh, the T20 side that we current, or we had going into the following year, it, it probably wouldn't have, he would have had to bat in the top three or four. And he, he's not, on, on the evidence we had at the time, there, that he probably wasn't going to feature with the, with the players that we had. So, you know, I, I said to all the players that, you know, there is an opportunity to reinvent yourself. There is a, a new coach, but we need evidence. Um, and that still exists now. And, you know, we know, obviously, we're now with Salty leaving. You know, Luke Wright has, you know, a couple of years left in the game. We will be looking for opening batters that can, can strike a white ball. Um, and we're going to have to look um, at those young players we've got and what a wonderful environment we have in 50 over cricket where they can uh, really uh, free themselves up and that's something that we've encouraged massively for, for a Tom Haynes to stake a claim, a Tom Clark, a Harrison Ward, whoever it might be, an Ali Orr to stake a claim, to open the batting because really in T20 cricket it is the best place to bat and also to suggest that players don't have to come through the tried and tested route of Red Bull all the way through. There is opportunity at Sussex to do it perhaps differently in a David Warner style of developing as a cricketer in white ball cricket that does naturally strike at the 130, 140 that we believe and know is, 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 a, is a reason for success or a, a result of success. Good debate, though. Yeah. Did Luke um, Wells reinvent himself in T20 as a bowler or a batter? Um, I don't think he's played enough games to be able to answer that question yet. But the fact is, he did been... he get in the side as a bowler or a batter? Um, I, I wouldn't know. I'm, I don't know any of the decision makers at Lancashire, so I don't know on what basis they were. I'm just saying that they were giving him that opportunity. What they saw in him as to why they wanted him in the 2020 side, I don't think he's played that many 2020 games for he them. Played he played as a bowler. But he did play some. Did he, he played as a bowler yeah, well, I, I, I don't who batted down the order. Right. And if you think he was a leg spinner, and then you look what Sussex have here yeah. with Rashid Khan or Will Beer or now Archie Lennon, he was never going to... So sometimes it can be... So he played as a bowler who batted down the order. Right. 
Okay, I, th- I think perhaps we'll we'll, we'll move. Uh, there's a gentleman over here. Are you, have you got a question? Is it on Luke Wells, sir? No, I'd like to move on. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd like to move on. But but, but <laughs> I'd, I'd like to move on too. But actually, is, is your question about Luke Wells, sir? No. Right. Okay. So I, I would say in the commentary, I've had more questions about Luke Wells than anything else this summer. Um, so is Luke Wells people? Thank you, Peter, for your question, but um, it, it, are, we, are we kind of done with that now? Has anyone got any other questions so we can move on to other subjects? OK, thank you. Gentleman in the front here, sir. Y- your name? David Harrison. David, thank you. Your question? I'd like to move on because I fully ap- appreciate what Ian and James have been doing in the last year. The fact that we finished bottom of the league is neither here nor there. My big concern is that we're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of our effort on bringing forward these young players who at some point are going to be attracted by money or by other elements to move county away from Sussex and we're going to lose them. And I'm very concerned that that's what might happen to this wonderful crop of of youngsters that we've got uh, under your wing at the moment. And why, why do you think that might happen? Uh, well, I don't want to get into the, the argument about the hundred and all it's that fine. No, but you can, nonsense. because it's important. But there clearly are going to be two forms of county ground. There's going to be the big counties, we, we all know who they are, and there's going to be the counties that have got smaller grounds that can never possibly attract the crowds that the bigger grounds attract. And young players are going to be attracted towards playing at the bigger grounds because, amongst other things, they'll get more money from that and they'll also get more attention from the critics and therefore have a better chance of playing for England. Which of you? Okay, I'll lend me the last comment, um, talking about the amount of people. We have more selectors here this summer than we've had in a very long time. We have a very good relationship with all the management at, with England, and they are absolutely loving what we're doing with the, our strategy and what we're trying to do with young cricketers. Haynes and Carson were very close to going on Lions. Three youngsters picked from the under-19s. Garton was obviously nearly close. So Robinson, how we prepared Robinson to perform in his test matches, they loved, did an amazing job. Obviously, we had CJ, Joffre, all these. We've never had more people involved with England. So I think that argument, if you do it right, it doesn't matter where you're from. Okay, we can't hide away from the fact 100. So we... Also this year, we've had the most unique... It's the first time in county championship history we've had like a natural break halfway through and you go to a different division. That, that's never happened before. So sometimes things that you normally make decisions at the end of a season or beginning of a season, there was a natural break this year where you can make decisions. OK? Then, obviously, youngsters... Kids, I've got a daughter, yeah, so yeah, there's things like that, bright lights, um, money, all these things are attractive to young cricketers. It's undeniable. I always dreamed of playing at Lords. I actually ironically know that Phil Salt, where he was born in North Wales, was dreamt of playing at Old Trafford in a test match. Did that have a massive sway? I think more than we realise, I know Salty very well. A very good friend of mine. I think that was as big a pull as anything. Okay? Yeah. Can you stop it? Ultimately, probably not. So you're right. But how can you alleviate that happening? Okay? Do you know how much, and I've, I've talked on interviews before, these kids who have signed up either on two or three year contracts, they are being looked after as well as they could ever be looked after at a county cricket club. They have all the facilities they can have, plus opportunity. It is huge what they're giving. Do you know what they are? They're also really close. They are all good mates. A lot of them play at Eastbourne together. They've been to school together or rival schools together. The chance you have to keep them together for a period of time is on values, 
mateship, want to achieve something together. So obviously this dining hall is being refurbed at the moment. There's a load of pictures missing. But before this, there was a load of pictures of Kurt Lee and Adams and all this. I was unfortunate. I didn't get to be in those pictures. So you can accuse me of leaving for bright lights and going to the Oval or whatever. But I can assure you I did that then, but I wouldn't do this now. But I understand where they could be coming from. And I do know why I didn't stay because the side I was playing with and grew up with with my mates was replaced by older people like a Bill Affey, who I love, Frank Stevenson, Eddie Hemmings, um, Jarvis, Evan. If we'd have kept the youngsters together, like a Jamie Hall, a Keith Greenfield, the um, Carlos Schremers, the Danny Laws, the Martin Spades, I wouldn't have left because I was playing with my mates. Because that's stronger than you, you think. That's our way that we keep them together for a period of time. And by looking after them, as well as we will do, and giving them... If it doesn't stop them playing in the 100 or playing for England, why wouldn't they want to come back to a safe place where they get the best coaching, the best opportunity, and get to play with your mates? Why do we start playing the game? Because we want to have fun with our friends. That's why we all want to play cricket. So the longer we can keep that together, the more chance we have of stopping what you just said. Because it won't stop them playing for England, because there's proof there's people around and watching them. It won't stop them getting picked for 100. We might miss them playing in a 50-over competition here as supporters and coaches. But then we'll have the next crop. I've just seen the next academy guys. They're raring to go. But if we give them the best coaches, then we see the next lot. So exciting for supporters, because in the 50-over comp, we get to see this next... It's like the, what is it, the Carling Cup or whatever. You get to see the next exciting group of youngsters coming through. We keep them together by, you know, keeping them close as people and friends and looking after them. It's known as a family club, but and that's everybody. If we're all appreciative of them as supporters and coaches, and they just want to play with their mates. That's how we keep them. But we won't stop them going off to Abu Dhabi or 100 or whatever or playing test cricket. But then they can always come back to a safe place, which is with their mates. Does that answer your question, uh, David? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, gentleman at, uh, in the third row, is it on a similar theme, sir? No, it's, but it's uh, about the development. And what's your name, sir? Michael Wilkinson. And my question, very simple is what is the philosophy on captaincy, particularly in the red ball? I mean, Travis Head is presumably only certain for a year, and looking forward, if you're building the team longer term, how does that fit in? I guess we'll address that to Ian as the, as the red ball head coach. Oh, thanks. Um, obviously, on Travis, um, he's an exceptional person in the change room. Um, he didn't have the success, and it burns him massively that he didn't have the success he wanted. Maybe him being delayed by five games, he turned up in Northampton, the grass was this long, and he was like, what is this? After scoring a load of runs. And if I have to, if anything, I can accuse him of trying too hard, which sometimes, as we all know, if we try too hard, Sometimes that can be detrimental. And it was just almost that he cared so much that he was letting people down, it almost affected his game. I know he's gone to Australia, he's taken swing balls, juke balls. Um, this is just on his performance because he's desperate to get back and prove everybody wrong. That's one side, his cricket side. As a human being in the changing room with everybody from the youngest to the oldest, he was an outstanding human being who knew how to communicate from here to there. And that's crucial in our changing room. Somebody who can relate. He's also got a lot of experience. He's been vice captain of Australia. Plus he's been South Australian captain from the age of 21. If I, perfect world how overseas used to be. You could have them for a period of time. We're very keen to have this relationship with Travis for 
a period of time. Um, have that continuity. His dream is to create, his hero is um, Darren Lehman. Who he, that's what he wants to replicate, because it's South Australians, what he did at Yorkshire, of what he wants to do at Sussex. And leading is massively important to him. But also you have to develop other leaders. And obviously when you're a young side, you want to develop leader. Hence Tom Haynes, who did an amazing job and more importantly, grew as a human being in these last few months. I panic probably as much as everybody else, is that gonna affect him scoring runs? Because you, it's, how do you know unless you give somebody a go? And I think his first game, and he didn't get so many runs, but then he got 100 in the 50 over um, and started playing really well. I also prayed that we batted first because then he wasn't going to be affected by fielding 50 overs and his head being scrambled and then having to go out and bat. But because, remember he was playing his first 50 over game, let alone being captain. He did an outstanding job. Then also he had then, in between time he had COVID, no preparation going into his first championship game after doing, I'm like, oh my goodness. Again, that question, will it affect his game? I think he got Lawton one. So I'm panicking as much as everybody else but I do know he's a good leader, a potentially good leader. And then I think he got a load of runs at the end of the season. So that sort of alleviated my worry. I know if I'd have said to Tom Haynes, do you want to be captain? He would have bitten my hand off. But it isn't the right time for him. George Garton. So we have, we have the captains, plus we have a leadership group. So they, they're Ali Orr is a PCA rep. He's arranged a really important meeting on Friday because we're addressing how the changing room feels, how the club is. We've got a PCA coming down. And it is obviously of all the events that have been happening around the counties. So he's showing leadership skills there. So it's not always what you do on the field. George Garton is another one, part of the leadership group. Unfortunately, the ones we had in the leadership group last year, Ollie Robinson, Phil Salt, Chris Jordan, have left. So that was our building from last year. Ollie Robinson did a, has done a great job. He's still vice captain, but obviously he's going to be busy, hopefully, for him. Chris Jordan captain brilliantly in the T20 games that he did. Now, I'm sure he's going to be a brilliant T20 captain at Surrey. Phil Salt has got amazing leadership qualities, but we can't do anything about people that leave. So now we have to then invest in others for leadership skills. Jack Carson's a massive leader. Leads in everything he does. So that's the succession plan. What does it look like in 2024 when hopefully having sustained success? It's really difficult to say sustained success a lot, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> that's why we don't do it. But going back, we, we don't want to just win once. We want to continue to do well in between time. And it's really important that you you create 11 leaders, that's ultimately, so giving people responsibilities at different times, and it's not the obvious ones by just naming somebody a captain or a vice captain, it's just giving them different roles to see how they respond, because it's, ultimately it's an individual game play within a team. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, can I just ask a follow-up question to that, Ian? Um, you were saying that uh, Travis didn't it wasn't here until the Northamptonshire game, so he missed, I think, that was the fifth championship game. What commitment do you have from Travis for this season? Will he be here for the opening game? Will he be here for the last game of the season as well? I thought you were here independently. I am. Um, I'm allowed to ask you questions. Have you heard this bloke interview me in a season? He gives me a really hard time all the time. We've got a love-hate relationship, haven't we? We have. Yeah. No, we love each other, really. Or hate to love each other. No, no, <laughs> one, 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 one of the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and it, it was massively important to us. I think that the statement is that we want somebody here from the start. It's as simple as that. Because we can't have that situation again where he's not there for five games. I'm looking at the Chief because that, that was massively, massively important to us. We, we, sure. we can't have that scenario. Whatever... Is that you, Chairman? That's the chairman's phone. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. My son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but th yeah, that's crucial. We, we can't have that same scenario again. That, okay. That's full stop. Especially now as captain. But again, the, 
these are plans that we're putting in place now. There's some that we're still trying to put in place, but you were talking about the ever-changing world of cricket. The last two years have been really difficult to navigate with COVID. Um, you know, we didn't know we were going back to two divisions. So whichever way you say you, we finished bottom of the second part of the season, we didn't finish bottom of the first part, finished bottom of the third, and they'll say that's 18 or whatever. It, it's immaterial because it didn't make any difference for what, where we're going to be this year because it was what we did in the 2019. Okay. <laughs> Which is a totally different yeah. concept. And, you know, the ever-changing, you know, at the time we, we, we were unsure that Travis was going to be involved with Australia. Suddenly he gets selected and that will, you know, there will be naturally games that, or test series or one-day series that are going to be rearranged or put in place, as we've all seen. And I think it's important to recognise that the, the landscape is forever changing. Um, I could go on all the coaching courses in the world. I could have been prepared as best I can. But it really has been an eye-opener in, in how it always changed. You, we try and make the best informed decision we can at the time. And, um, you know, we've got nothing but that desire to, to do it in that way, as I say, we, the, the thought of Travis getting selected again for Australia, we know it was hopeful, we know he'd had a good season, um, but it looks like he, he could end up batting number five in, in three weeks' time, and we wish him all the best. And yet we want our players, and he is, we want to Sussex fire him. We do want him to be a, a long-term part of this club. But if he goes on and plays well for Australia, that's good for Travis. And ultimately, you know, they've... Some people have outlined that he, he'd had a tough time in England, but he, he's come through, come through it. So um, it is worth remembering. And it's, I say, uh, it can be frustrating. I know that you want to have these long-term relationships, but, you know, the, that it's the right man as we believe that is going to be is going to help and influence and develop this side and these players for the future so but, since, say, but since then did you know so we signed him do you know then how many tours have been announced since that announcement australian tours yeah so they're playing two, two. Right. which are in the summer our summer yeah so that's the ever-changing and that's where it's difficult and we're always in contact with Keith and whatever. So that's your best laid plans. Do you try and get ahead of the game? And then they're playing Pakistan just for the start of season and then they've got one against Sri Lanka that was announced all after we did what we did. Yeah. It's ever changing all the time. It's so tricky. But I promise you again, we make every decision going back to a strategy of what we believe is best. Gentlemen at the back. Sorry, your name, sir? My name is Craig. I've got a question, please, to um, Ian Salisbury. Ian, in 2003 to 2007, we had the best team on this planet. The likes of Richard Montgomery, Murray Goodwin, Chris Adams, Matt Pryor, James Curley, yourself, Mushtag. Those were exciting times to come down to the county ground, really were. We had a team then, I'm sure, James, you can say to this, you didn't want to lose. You didn't know how to lose. Many, many a times I came down here and thought, wow, what a team we got. The last couple of years we've been struggling. And Ian, you've got a tough job to bring back that winning mentality. Do you have any plans for that? Can, can I just... Go first, yeah. Let me just go first there. I think it, it's very easy. Um, I, hey, it's very easy for me to, to remember the good times. What I think is, is vital to remember, in 2000, we were bottom of everything. Okay, so we were bottom of the second division in, in 2000. There was talk of Morsey, Grizz losing their, their roles. Thankfully, the club saw what we were about. Um, they saw the individuals, they knew it was gonna take time. And 2001, we made, you know, we made a very good recruitment in, in Muzz joining us, and then subsequently Mushy was the icing on the cake. So it, it's important to remember where we were in 2000. I think it's equally important to remember in 1997, I think I only bowled in the second innings four times that year. That's how bad we were. That's how bad we were being beaten. 
that I only bowled in the second innings four times that year. Now, that was great because I got to put my feet up. It didn't really reflect very well on where we were in our results. But it built a resilience in the likes of Jason and I, Robin Martin Jenkins. It built a resilience in Mark Robinson, who joined, who started to understand the journey that we were on. And slowly but surely, in um, some very fine young players coming through, in, in Matt, in Tim Ambrose, Mike Yardy, um, Carl Hopkinson towards the end of that era, uh, you you go through it and Tony Cotty joining. These are all vital cogs. But I say at the, in 97, you know, there was, um, you know, I, I still haven't really forgiven Souls for leaving, I must admit. But um, it, it, it is a reminder and I do, I do get it. But also what I do see is I see some young players that have that resilience, have that drive. I see, as I say, I alluded, you know, the Jack Carson, Henry Crokin partnership to try and wrestle a game away from North Hans. The way that Jamie Atkins raced in, um, you know, I can think of, you know, lots of areas, the, you know, the way that Dan Ibram, him batted so selflessly at Worcester. Um, Jamie Coles' debut at the Oval, Archie, you know, what he achieved in the T20. There are glimpses and I get it, but I think it could be as exciting to be, I'd love to see you in four years time and go, that was a hell of a journey to be on, wasn't it? It didn't look so rosy in, uh, in that meeting. And I, I agreed with you. It, it doesn't, if you look at it in black and white, but the journey could be far more enjoyable than seeing direct results um, from a side. And we have to understand that's, that's where we are. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so just on that, obviously, if you think, obviously, 96, where Sussex were, I did leave and it started stuff. That's seven years till 2003. That's a long time to turn things around where things didn't go. I, I was hoping that when you said, how are we going to do it? I thought we'd explain that. We were trying to explain this with our strategy. If we didn't get it across, I apologise. We have a clear strategy of where we want to go. Um, and it is, if you, you mentioned some of them, you mentioned Montgomery's, um, a lot of those you mentioned, Chris Adam, there's a lot that weren't Sussex, the hardcore, your Kirtleys, your Lurie's, etc. But Mushy, so the heart, we want the, literally the, the core to be Sussex through and through. But I think it's important to then Sussex five people around that as well. Murray Goodwin, he will, yeah. he'll be remembered for Sussex, but is a Zimbo, whichever way you're looking at it. Chris Adams, was he just Sussex? A lot of people think he's Sussex. I know he's from Derby, or Chesterfield to be more correct. I know Montgomery, you ever think he might be Sussex, but I know he's from North Fat well, rugby to be true. And Mushy definitely isn't Sussex, but he'll be known as Sussex. Law was Ron and Navi. But the, the core of it was, I don't know, Peter Moores, is a Macclesfield boy through and through via Worcester to Sussex. It's how you get there and it's Sussex fine, the whole thing. That took seven years. I could argue then what's happened from 2007 onwards. That's why we believe that we've got to start somewhere to try and make a difference, to turn that around, to bring back those days. And that, that's what we want to try and create. Because not much has happened, if I look at it that way. I left 96 because I was really frustrated of how things were going, ultimately. I wasn't happy with the direction it was going. I couldn't see. Like I said to you earlier, a lot of my friends were just being... Jamie Hall was a hell of a cricketer. Maybe not a David Smith or whatever at that time, but he could have been. Keith Greenfield could have been. Martin Spate definitely could have been. Danny Law could have been. It really frustrated me that I couldn't play with my mates. Brad Donlan was shifted. Even We really wanted to succeed down here, and it felt like it was being torn apart. And that, that is the main reason I left. Because it wasn't going or being done how I thought was the right way. Almost for a quick fix, which didn't work. Which sort of, was it the 93 final we lost, which was really frustrating. 
but it went downhill. 94, the team we lost to flew because they did it the right way, which was Warwickshire. So we, we, I haven't going nowhere. I don't want to go anywhere because I want to make a real difference this time. Because I, and I believe what we talked about the youngsters, that is crucial because I knew that that was the bit that made me leave in the first place. And I know if we keep those together and then expand around that, it'd be great if Travis ended up being the new Murray Goodwin. Does that answer your question, Craig? Um, yeah, it certainly has. I, I'm saying it, Ian and James, from a supporter's point of view. I'm, I'm a member here. And as a member, every one of us wants to see Sussex do well. Sure. I came here when the late and great Ted Dexter, Jim Parks, John Snow came out of that dressing room. And later on, the Nawaba Patoli was there. And then we had the likes of Kahan Mendes mm -hmm. and people like Kepler Vessels. We didn't win anything then, Ian. We won, 20, we won what we call the, the, the 40 overs, the Gillette Cup. We never won the... I think the best we finished in the championship was about seventh. But Sussex took the wooden spoon time, but there were still exciting times. And I think a lot of us, all of us here, look forward to you, um, Ian, to bring back the good times, to bring back the 2003 to seven. To say, wow, wasn't that... And Tom Haynes, brilliant 200 or whatever. We're looking forward to you, Ian, bring that back to us. That's what we want. And James. <laughs> Sorry, trust me, he does it well. I'm just like... No. Thank you, Craig. Well, it's... Rachel, the, the picture we had at the start of the year, all I'll say is there was a picture I saw the other day. I've definitely gone greater than James has in the last year. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you, Craig, for your question. I, I, I have a very serious heart defect. And coming to Sussex now, I'm thinking to myself... I was here in 2003. I didn't have heart problems. I was here right up till seven. But then I had a very serious heart attack. And before I go, while I leave this planet, I want to see you, Ian, bring some glory back to Sussex. Thank well, you. There's a lot of pressure on so. your health. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's all down to you, Ian. Right. Um, thank you for your question, Craig. There are lots more questions around the room. Gentleman up over here with his... Uh, uh, Sam's going to run around with... Uh, Keep Sam going like that. The microphone, yeah. Just keeping him fit. Hi, uh, Gary Knight. Hi, Gary. Hi, hi, Adrian. Um, yeah, just to, first, I, before I answer my question, uh, I just want to sort of say I completely 100% agree with the policy and strategy you guys have got. I think it's the right way to go. Um, I spend a lot of my time on social media defending the club and as the season went on, the difficult performances. Um, but patience, obviously, is not what it should be sometimes <coughs> for some of the supporters. But personally, I do, you know, as I say, agree with what you're doing. You. My question is about Ben, uh, ben Brown. Um, obviously, he was removed from the, compa the, the captaincy this year. Could you just explain the rationale behind that? Because I don't feel it was totally explained, at least to my thinking, uh, sufficiently. And also, will he be here next season? And if he is, will he be keeping in all formats or just red ball or one or the other, or white ball? Sorry, too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, thank you for your support, obviously. Um, that's yeah. crucial. I think I answered earlier unique season how it split so we knew then we were going to be in the third division ultimately um, would it have changed maybe if we were in the first division I can't answer that because we weren't but it might not have done because things were obviously going in a good direction any decisions like I said earlier that are made are in front of a performance committee of seven it can't, it can't just be one person's decision because it has to be rational so Ben had been doing it four and a half years and not much had changed. So we just, the rationale, seven people, eight people voted we needed a change. Ben Brown is a player, luckily he's here for another two years. Um, the rationale for him not to keep towards the end was a little bit like playing all the youngsters. We wanted to find out more about them, including Oli Carter. So I think you would have all seen, well, you can't miss Ollie Carter, actually. <laughs> and I, I take my hat off to somebody who has a haircut like that, because there's no way. <laughs> You're going to draw attention to yourself, but you have to be <coughs> confident and a brave and a hell of a cricketer, actually, to do that. And it was a, a great opportunity to see his skills as a keeper, as it was to play all the youngsters as well. Rather than play people who weren't going to be here or play overseas, we, were, we couldn't win the championship. It was a <laughs> unique opportunity. I, look, did I, I don't enjoy losing, by the way. I'm a, I'm a poor loser. It's, it's, I, just to get that across. 
but I want to stay strong to a strategy on where we want to go. I know there's loads of evidence if you play and studies, if you play youngsters early enough and give them opportunity, you get the best out of them in the future. Okay. The, will he keep, he wasn't, he doesn't play T20 cricket then anyway, or hasn't done. He's, his numbers are, keeping was, is never off the table. It was just that time. It was giving Ollie a chance. But also out of that, I also wanted to see if Ben Brown could open the bat in him 50 over cricket. And I think anybody who saw him, he's never opened the bat in 50 over cricket. That was a unique opportunity for somebody who's... I also wanted to see what he'd be like playing without captaincy. Does that unburden him to become an even better cricketer? He batted superbly in 50 over cricket. And then obviously, <laughs> then, I think we've had a problem batting at three for a period of time. It was a unique chance to see a Sussex person through and through who's a battler and a good player. He's never batted at three. He scored all his runs and averages, a lot of his 40s, 50s at number six and seven. So a chance to see him bat at three was, again, a unique opportunity in four-day cricket because we were in the third division. And again, he got a load of runs. I think he, he, he averaged 78 batting at three. Is that because... Because he might not have been captain, I don't know. But it was still a chance to do that. Um, he'd done it for four and a half years then. Um, and had some good sides amongst that. So we just believed as a committee that it was the right time to have a change. Um, and also would it happen in the middle of the season outside of a unique opportunity? I don't think so. It would have probably happened at the end of the season. I, th I think also that the, the dynamic of the side changed quite dramatically as well. And so you, you, from what was a side that he would have captained in the end of 2019 or 2020, how that had rapidly changed in 2021, the makeup of the side was very different and therefore the relationships would be very different as well. So going forward then to next season, uh, the question about do you foresee him keeping in Red Bull or White Bull too? Have that been, has that decision um, been made yet? Again, or? I think the, the 50 over White Ball for, for, for EG, I'm pretty sure I would go back to Oli Kai. It's the development side. I have to see him develop. Keeping's definitely not off the table for him in Red Bull cricket, no. He's got two years to go on his contract. He's an important player for us going forward. Um, we want him around. Um, you, you, again, it's surrounding these youngsters with <coughs> experienced players who are Sussex through and through and care about the club. And so it would be beautiful if you could bat free and keep, because that's your perfect scenario, so it solves both dramas. Mm -hmm. But all I know, having played with something like Alex Stewart, I know when he kept, he batted at six or seven. When he didn't keep, he batted at the top of the order. So I think if he was keeping, he would move down the order, that is for sure. Does that answer your question, Gary? It does, yeah, thanks. Just one follow-up question I had from Gary's question to Ian and James. The performance committee, who's that comprised of and how often do you meet? Oh, so we're going to throw him under the bus now. Um, no, no, I just wondered who was on it. No, it Is that it, you asking that question? Or? No, we, yeah. yes. I think it's, it's important that, you know, these are all the things that you, as a young... A, as a player, and then as a young developing coach, you're probably not always aware of the, the machinations. And yes, we meet regularly, you know, and we, the, there's the chairman, the vice chairman, the treasurer, uh, Rob, Keith, uh, ourselves, and usually another board member. And it, the, the strength of it is that we are reminded to, to check back sure. to what we're about. It's very easy as a coach when you are, especially as a new coach, um, that you can get very emotional, you can get very quick. You want to quick make decisions. Um, anyone who knows me knows I want everything in order. I want everything there and prepared. You know, what I've rapidly <laughs> learned that, that that isn't possible, certainly not in cricket, not even with my best intentions, with all the best spreadsheets in the world that I might prepare uh, at all the time. I really should do other things but um, I think it's important that it is a it is a check back to what we're about that we're not making these decisions in isolation that we're not making these decisions 
for a knee-jerk reaction. We're not making because, I mean, Sauls and I aren't on social media. You know, we thankfully uh, don't have those problems, but it could be easily sway thoughts and ideas. But, you know, the regular meetings, the real, regular check-ins with Keith and with Rob and various other members of the committee are, are massively important that we, we stay true to this because <laughs> we are, we're fully invested in this. And it, it isn't, um, this isn't just something we're going to do for 21, 22. You know, this is something that we've got full conviction um, and that it will require a bit of patience and success might be defined in different ways other than potentially league positions. And as I say, I can refer back to what our young players are doing <coughs> recognised at international level or the performances of a, a Jack Carson. Success can be defined in many, many ways. And um, I think it's, it just, it's good to, to remind ourselves of that from, from time to time. Thank you. That's a, that's that a good answer. answer. It does answer indeed. Bob's on there as well. Thank you. Who, who else is on Chairman, there? Vice Chairman, Treasurer. Chairman, Vice Thank Chairman, Treasurer. 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 Lovely. Bob and Keith. Thank you. That's and then we're invited on. But they don't talk to us all the time. A good, <laughs> that's a good answer, James. Thank you. Sorry, gentlemen, the uh, two gentlemen. First of all, gentlemen in the, in the back row. What's your name, sir? Hello there, I'm Mark. Hello, Mark. Um, firstly, thanks a lot to Ian and James to do this. It's absolutely fantastic that you're being so open and honest, and it's yeah, a great opportunity for all of us fans. So, yeah, thanks a lot for taking your time to, to do it. Um, it's touching on the question that uh, David at the front row mentioned before. Um, last season, Luke Wright mentioned that uh, the club really needs to improve its retention of players and its recruitment. And this is something that has been a very frustrating thing for fans over the last three or four years. We've seen our squad and team steadily get worse and worse. And unfortunately, this season, we've seen two of our better players leave as well. Um, and if you look at our recruitment, unfortunately, a lot of it hasn't worked out. I'm thinking of people like Stuart Meeker and Mitch Claydon. Uh, what's gone wrong with this and what is going to change to, to improve it? And secondly, back to the gentleman's question here, can you guarantee fans that Ben Brown is not the next star to leave. OK, so a couple of... Who, who, who got to point there? Um, look, I think that there's been a sense of frustration in that. I think... Um, I, I understand the frustration. That sometimes there are uh, areas of a player's decision that are out of our control. Now, that... <laughs> Like I say, you know, if 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 Phil Salt believes that he has uh, there's greater ambition, or there's always been an affiliation, that's where he went to watch his first game of county cricket at Old Trafford. That might be a factor that we there's nothing that we can do to to change that situation. The financial constraints and the financial responsibility that the club had to have over the business are again some of the things that we we can't always control. However. What I would say going forward is that the the recruitment, the due diligence that Ian and I are doing now, and I think you know we, I think it seems to be old news of the signings of Finn Hudson Prentice to bring a player back of that calibre who was the leading wicket taker in the T20 uh, for the North Division, who by everyone's reckoning is. Uh, an, an all-rounder and a player whose stock is on the up. You know, I, I think it's easy to forget, you know, Finn Hunter Prentice probably doesn't gain the same headlines. Uh, Stephen Finn, you know, the last time Stephen Finn played for Middlesex, he took five wickets against Somerset at Taunton. You know, the, the due diligence that we're doing with those players, um, I'm not saying was absent before, but, you know, one of the words that we put up there was accountable. Now, if the decisions under our watch don't turn out to be the right ones, then fair enough, we, we can be called to account. And likewise, you, yeah, it is hard. We have to find uh, replacements and recruitment, and we are doing it, as I say, with the, the best intentions in mind. Um, do we have control over it if a player... I say, we don't have that full control over players. You know, CJ, we did everything we could. CJ chose to, to go and go to Surrey. There was the captaincy. 
Uh, and I, he, he, I think he had unfinished business there. And, you know, you know, talking to him over the winter, you know, again, these guys we are ever so close to. We, we want to get close to our, our players. We want to, to understand and we know them as people. CJ was hurting after that final, uh, sorry, the semi-final. You know, it was important to touch base, check in where he is. He's still someone that I have uh, a lot of time and huge respect for. Um, but sometimes it is totally out of, out of our control. Um, but it is, as I say, with the, the recruitment, you know, we are not going to make knee-jerk reactions just to fill spots. We're not, we don't have to be rushed if we're prepared to be patient. That there will be players that fit with what we need, with the skill set, the character, what they're going to offer, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch, are vitally important. And there's no point blocking an opportunity um, for a player or the type of player we want just to fill what seems as a perceived hole. So we have to make the right decisions all the time. And if we can be patient, if we keep checking back to the strategy, we will more often than not make the right decisions and as I say it's it might not be the headlines that you always want but I, I still think that you know Stephen Finn and Finn Hunt's apprentice will be two fine signings I think we've seen what uh, Finn Hunt's apprentice could do already I think the the energy that he had the the skill that he showed um, is there for all of us to see um, and Stephen Finn you know I you know, good luck to anybody who's written him off. I know, I saw the Middlesex players. They were um, gutted that he was leaving Middlesex. They, they know he's got uh, a career with unfinished business. And uh, having worked with him really closely in the last couple of months, um, it's hugely exciting. And, you know, his skill set is, is right up there. And, you know, I've got to back myself uh, and back our decision making that I'm sure we will see some very fine performances from him in years to come. Just, but, uh, just about uh, those two, it was very apparent chatting to them how keen they were to come here. That's massively important. You want people who want to be here, who want to make a difference. Steve Finn is an absolute badger about cricket and he's been following what we've been doing here and loves the project. Not only does he want to reinvigorate himself, he wants to prove people wrong, but he also wants to help this group of youngsters. He's here while we're playing against his old club in a Sussex tracksuit and happily walking around along the seafront going to stay in a hotel because he wants to be here. That's crucial. See, we can't... And Finn hudson Pratt says, turn to him, again, unfinished business. When he left, he is now ready to fly. Steve Finn's 32. He's also the youngest bloke to get to 100 test match wickets. We can't forget the calibre of cricketer he is. And to attract somebody like that who wants to come here is crucial. So recruitment is also about people who want to be here. We won't sign somebody just for the sake of it. So there might be people who are not available this year, but there might be next year who we feel will fit in. And that's also a big element. They have to believe in what we're doing here. So we've delivered the same strategy, what we're doing and how we want to go about it. That's, that's why Mike Yard is rejoined. Because he wants to be part of what we're doing here and have an influence. And that's the sort of people we want to attract. Um, also, uh, ben Brown's got two years to go, so he can't go anywhere. <laughs> so. OK. Thank you, Martin. Does that answer your question? I think uh, the gentleman in the, the, the back row wanted to ask a, a question. Uh... Hi, my name's Martin. Hello, Martin. Um, there's a great expression in horse racing about uh, winners breeding winners. And moving, moving on from that in terms of your performance committee, which I'm, I, this is very much a view from the boundary. I haven't got much information about Sussex. I played for Gloucestershire a long time ago with Jack Russell, under 19. OK, but I've lost touch with the game, so for me, a lot of these names they mean something in the distance, but they don't mean very much in terms of currently, so there's no, there's no personalities here for me. Performance, performance committee sounds very much, it's well documented that uh, decision-making by committee isn't necessarily the best way forward. It sounds like very much group responsibility and share responsibility, share responsibility which has its place, but ultimately, 
a diverse group around a table with contributions and opinions about certain subjects, whether it be recruitment or players' averages or whatever it may be, is important. And ultimately, decision making is about individuals and taking accountability for that rather than group responsibility for decisions that may work out or may not work out. Do you think that going towards committees is the right way forward rather than actually individuals heading departments being responsible for those decisions but taking advice from interested parties in terms of contribution and opinion? I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, uh, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I'm sort of a little bit confused. Um, I I, ultimately, I mean, <laughs> that's okay. I, I think in general where you go in the right direction is, is good to have, but like individual decisions you, you make on who plays or doesn't play, or if ultimately if the committee decide the results are not going the right way, then they can still get rid of me. That's a collective decision. Ultimately, the 11 that goes out there in two forms of the game will be my, I will have to be accountable for results and people's performances. Right. The collective thing is just making sure it's not... I think if you have one person's opinion on one subject, then it, it might be wrong. No, I, I agree with that entirely. Okay. I'm talking about... Sorry. Ultimate decision-making re really comes down to individuals. Yes, you, 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 you take contribution an opinion from my diverse group around the table. Yeah. Okay, very important. I completely concur. Okay, but I think having a vote amongst those people, okay, isn't necessarily the right way forward, in my humble opinion. Okay, James? No, I, I, I see what you're saying about the, the, the sort of democratic idea of a vote. I think ultimately um, it is ensuring that we are, that the, the, the decisions that potentially are being proposed are being checked against what we've set out, that we aren't, make, that we aren't going off strategy. Now, whether th those decisions or those ideas or thoughts on certain elements where a coach, um, and you know, it's only the coaches that are here, obviously, this evening, but you know, if I'm working with Wrighty and we're deciding on who, who goes out and who plays and what the balance of the squad is, that's, that's ultimately down to us. And, you know, and if we get quizzed or whether we, we're challenged and the best way of it working is that we are challenged, but we can always refer back to what we know are our beliefs and our strategy. That's the I think that's the role personally, it, or my opinion, is that I'm being challenged or checked against what I laid out uh, as a as a coach or how I believed uh, the club could move forward and develop and be successful. Okay, I accept that completely. And I'm, I'm not here to say Thank you thank very you much indeed. Right. Just, okay. just a very quick thank follow up. Can I just ask a very quick follow up, follow up question? Sure. Cultural change on the basis of that, we all know that cultural change in the workplace takes a long time. Okay? And cultural change is much better headed by individuals rather than necessary group uh, mentality. Discuss. Okay. Well, yeah, no, I think it comes from the bottom as well, rather than the top down. And I think that's where we are. You'll hear us talk about investing in the player. Uh, sorry, the person before the player, and that if we can um, encourage a Jamie Atkins, who actually, you know, amongst our leaders, is actually uh, has an ability to lead a group, has a has a presence, mainly due to his physical stature. <clears throat> but to educate him and help him develop and encourage him to develop himself off the pitch, that he can then be that, um, that leader, that have that single-mindedness desire to say, do you know what, I'm going to take you guys with me um, because, you know, that's some of the best leaders that you can have. It, I, I, thank you, but it, 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 they are, yeah, they are, most of them are 19 year old or younger, but they don't even know themselves. But we, you, we can only encourage and um, it's not, you know, yes, we, we have our, <laughs> Sauls and I have our own children, but you, you get very attached to their development because you see what they're trying to give back and all we can do really um, is try and give them the best chance to develop in that way. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Good question. Yes, sir. In the uh, 
gentleman here, Sam, in the uh, third row. In fact, two, two questions. Gentlemen. <laughs> He's been I was going to say him. gentlemen with the glasses, but they've both got glasses. Let him go first. <laughs> okay. um, Tony, it's not my question, but I just want to say I hope you can motivate Delray Rawlings into finding some form next season. Um, my question is that... Uh, is that I spoke a question or a statement? No, it's just... It was just okay. Is it a question? No, it's just a point. OK. I'd just like to say that um, I spoke to the ex... Uh, pathway director, who must admit his departure was kept very quiet by the club, even even then when they op, op, uh, open up his job uh, vacancy. But he said to me that um, the players don't mind losing because they're a hard bunch of of youngsters. But there comes a time when, if you're not going to be able to win a match, and I'm talking about the four day game, then you lose some. You, you, your confidence does must drop. And I think that would, and I think the youngsters, I've, I've watched a lot of cricket last year, I've been to, went to three away games, and the youngsters are a boom, a boom to the club, and there's, some of them have got a long future, but they do need experience, and that, you can't, you just need experience at the top of the, at the, top of the uh, batting order, and someone who, you want to, uh, now, now someone like, um, uh, Chris Jordan has disappeared. We need a mentor on the field of play because you don't want to see their heads drop. No, I think, look, um, I'm sure Sol Souls will follow up on this. I think that's where a Stephen Finn can fulfil uh, a CJ role. Um, I think there's time, as we say, that um, I think Tamal Mills in the T20 could take on that role at mid-off to, you know, the, the experience that he's gaining. But I think the... What happened last season? I'd be interested to know which three away games you went to. But I went to uh, Headingley, Canterbury, and Worcester. Okay, so Worcester, right? There was a there was, was the a game. Average age of that side at Worcester. Yeah. What was the average age of the side at Worcester? It was uh, fairly young. Nineteen and a half. Day, Nineteen. Who was the side in charge to? the last two sessions of that game? Uh, we, were, we, were, we were in charge until the Holly Carver was doing easy stumping. And then after that, they, took, they, 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 they got their runs rapidly the last session. And they took a punt. And, you know, opposition is allowed, you know, a, uh, an experienced player like um, Brett Oliveira coming in in that time, it was do or die. Now, the, um, the part for me is that they're... It, it wasn't by design. You know, we, we didn't, you wouldn't by design put out that team. But we also had belief that the, the environment that, regardless of the result, was going to be a safe one and one that they were going to learn from. And yes, you know, our time and our thoughts and our discussions now are about ensuring that we do have those pillars of seniority around the side, hence why... Um, Someone like Stephen Finn uh, is such an important addition to our squad, for example. And so, you know, to get that uh, balance right is key. We're not always going to get it right, but we also know that these guys have got some real guts and resilience. And to show the fight that they did to, to control a game for that long, and yes, you know, there was a, a potentially a, a tipping point in that game. They were gutted as anyone, but that will be a scar that will, they will itch at. It will be a, uh, a memory as to why they're working so hard, as to why they will stay as tight as they will do um, to ensure, you know, I'm not saying it won't happen again. I'm just, they will do everything they can to, to, to learn from that experience and be better prepared for an occasion that, you know, when they go on to challenge for winning divisions, winning championships, that they have learnt from, you know, if that was the penultimate game of the championship and you need to get over the line to win it, then they've had that experience or they've had that little scar that will just itch to remind them what they have to do. Uh, there was uh, those three games went to after six o'clock on the fourth day, all three of those games. Uh, and there's no such thing as a, there's no such thing as an easy stumping, by the way. <laughs> and I'm also actually the, 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 
the more disappointing games were here. All right. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing, but those three games. Okay. Oh, yeah, we, we didn't like that either, to be honest. I said to you I dislike losing. But that, those, all those three games went till after six o'clock with very young sides. And the Canterbury, when we pushed <coughs> really hard and got close, I think if Jamie Atkins had been fit second in, it could have been different. The Yorkshire, when we showed a lot of fight in that game, we had the worst of conditions. First day, um, Ben and Dan played really well. We, we batted the whole innings on the lights. If you remember, and then we, was it Jamie and Ben at the death? But I remember Malam being dropped on 20, <laughs> a, a catch that went to the right, a first slip's hand. Um, and these things happen, and that could have changed the game totally. By the way, there's no such, that was obviously Ollie's first championship game, I think. But he, that's, it's no such thing as easy stumping, but that game we were in charge, Worcester panicked big style. And it was their number one side. And what, what I've tried to put into the players this winter and explain to them a little bit during the summer, these guys are playing for the first time. They're just out of school. They're happy they're getting paid. They're playing against people who, I can't totally, they're nasty. They're hardened professionals. I'm trying to explain to these guys who, that these are people who are paying for their mortgages, paying for their kids, and they would do absolutely anything I use the word bleat to you up and do anything. And this is the hardness what we're trying to get into these guys to make them understand. And the word we're using all the time, this is everything that your professional cricketers, your professional cricketers, their, their rise has been so quick. You know, three of them have gone back to school that were playing in that game. We did our um, appraisals with them and they're all in their school uniform <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> But those three players have done unbelievably well. We're trying to get their results in place because they're going off with young England. But it, it was quite bizarre doing an appraisal with a professional cricketer who was still at school. But they, they scored a fifth youngest half century in, on debut. Archie got man of match in his second game. Cole's performed in all the games he's played. Those games were so close. I could go through other games where we were in it for three days. Yeah, just um, picking up on that Worcester game, actually, there were six teenagers in the side. James Coles, Ollie Carter, Dan Ibrahim, Archie Lenham, Henry Crocombe and Joe Sarrow. And the Yorkshire game you were talking about, the average age of the side was 23. Uh, Haynes, Orr, Van Zell, Thomasin, Head, Brown, Ibrahim, Carson, Mika, Crocombe and Atkins. And it was a good game. His first five for Jamie Atkins. Yes, it was. That was his first five for... Yeah. So no, thank you. your question, but d trust me... These guys don't like losing, 100%. But they're used to winning. This is the thing that frustrates them. So when they play throughout the academy, play for Sussex age groups, when they play for Eastbourne or wherever they play, they are used to winning. This burns them. But they're coming up against people that are tough. Is it, is it literally motivating them this winter? Oh my God, yes it is. I can promise you they're going hell for leather. To answer your question about Delray, this is the first winter we're going to have him. He's just gone away and done really well for Bermuda, but we've got him here, other than Christmas, here for the first full winter that we've had the chance to work with Del. Did I see a guy who wants to succeed? Yes. And he, he's not stupid because he knows his numbers. We're all... Whichever way, you can be a nice guy, you can do this, whatever, but we all get judged, unfortunately, by numbers, what we do at work or at school or whatever. He knows his numbers. <coughs> is he talented? Yes. Is he determined to turn it around? Yes. So I, I'm really excited to have him around all winter. Uh, sorry, so I'll come to you in a moment. Um, yeah, and, and you were saying Jamie Atkins, five, five for 98 against Yorkshire. That was his first go. Uh, that's all, you, you, your question, then I'll, then I'll come to your thing, Mr. Peter. Your, you pleasure. Um, uh, I, I sit with... I, I sit you. with um, my friend Tony um, watching cricket and um, uh, he's, he's always happy really at the end of the day, I can tell you that. And um, he... Uh, Good. He Is he your next keeper? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he, he hasn't even got that excuse. Oh, okay. He... Um, he um, I, I just wanted to say I, I enjoyed your presentation Im immensely. I thought it was really informative and um, I... Uh, 
enjoy so much seeing these young players coming through. It's a, it's a real joy. And I think they've been, I think you've done incredibly well to, to, to bring such a good crop together through at the same time. And um, I'm looking forward to all their futures. Um, so and we, I, I wanted so are we, to, by the way, we're really I, excited. I Can't wanted tell. to make sure that the conveyor belt, the academy conveyor belt is, um, is going to continue uh, to produce like that. And I just wanted to ask you about um, Richard Halsall. I, I don't actually know too much about him, um, uh, except that I read an article, and it, he may have written it himself, but it was about his, um, his uh, way of tabulating the careers of very young cricketers and, and, uh, and trying to pick out talent, I, I suspect. How about um, uh, you talk about um, Stitch? Uh, I wa first of all, I don't know... Um, whether the guy's leaving or has left, because I don't think we, there's any okay. any can, announcement being we, made we about that. Can, 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 can I, just, for, just for you, so, so, that, that, that's, I don't know if, are you Mick? I am. Yeah, right, okay, because that, so whilst welcoming Yards, Richard Housel did a remarkable job at Sussex. What's happened to him? So we get, you can answer more. Can we the, the convey about? Okay, so we're a landlocked county, so that's why we got the partnership with Oxford as well. So other counties have the luxury of it. We've got some unbelievable schools and state systems and some unbelievable coaches in the pathway. Just to make you understand, we work really a lot with Rich as well, but both myself and James, you know, the second school, we're not just head coaches. I look at all the spinners coming through, all the way down the line. James does the same with Seamers. We also work with other coaches of how we want them to coach our players. And then we've got likes of Phil Hudson, Ashley Wright, and, and obviously now Yards, and what Stick did as well. Richard Housel, sorry, he's known as Stick, so it'll be hard for me to keep saying Richard. Stick. You know, stick. Well, you've seen the side of him. He literally <laughs> looks like a stick. Um, yes, he did a remarkable job. Um, but there are some still talented, just seeing the next crew coming through. Um, and then I think, is it the 13s are really exciting yeah. age as well. So we're aware of, and then we've got our analysts who make sure that all their fixtures, everything at Blackstone is filmed. So I know from spinners, any spinner that's bowled in the pathway, um, from academy upwards and on down, we've got literally every single ball they've bowled filmed. We've got all the TV cameras set up within the hall there that's always filming. Well, I know it's a big, big brother, but it's so we can monitor progress and what they're doing. So there's a lot of method in our madness of protecting everything because we realise we're a small county and not surrounded by massive catchment areas as well. So it's vital we do everything right. And so it's crucial we recognise the talent, but also leave it open enough that we're not closed either, because we want to encourage as many people as we can to come into it. Um, again, we, we'll miss Rich. Um, again, things move on. But Rich is a fast-moving guy. I'll let you go into more detail, but he was part of 100. He's at the, he was at the T20 World Cup with Afghanistan. He was, now he's at the T10. He's been at the PSL. He's been fielding coach at Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, England. He's been at Marlborough College with it. He's been at Bryan College. He's, this guy doesn't stick in one place for long. Stick is not, that's the wrong word. That's his nickname. But, um, and again, like players, sometimes people move on and then you will miss him. As I, I'm great friends with Phil Salt and CJ. I play with CJ. I'm going to miss him terribly. But also... Although he didn't speak to me, we're still friends now. When I left, sometimes sports fast moving. You know, Ford's just left Leicester. Who would have thought he'd go to Leicester and go to Sale? You know, people move. That that sport, unfortunately, I'm going to miss Stick. But then we've got Yards as well. So I'll let you more on Rich. Yeah, look, he it's a hey, he's out in the T10 at the minute, and he's asking me questions a bit about this at the other. He was a. Uh, he is a very fine coach. He's, he's someone who comes into your environment and makes you better. And to have him around for the last two or three years was vital in, 
in this period of transition in bringing these academy lads through. Um, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough of him. I think, you know, the, the fact that he's in that demand, um, you know, he is Andy Flowers' right-hand man. I believe there's every chance that Andy, they're increasing the number of IPL teams. I will be absolutely astonished if Andy Flower isn't a head coach of one of those new IPL franchises. I mean, he is a man in demand who, who goes around winning these tournaments around the world and Richard's never far behind. So, um, look, he, he did amazing work with us. The Pathways app that he introduced uh, really did measure uh, our players and to understand that none of you know, our opinions and thoughts about players were backed up with evidence. And you'll, you'll keep hearing probably more from me than anybody else that we need to be better informed about these players. Luke Dunning is an incredible analyst at 24, is going to go all the way. And he, you know, you would have seen he was right by my side during the T20 competition with his insights and thoughts on the game. His biggest passion is talent ID. And I don't, um, I don't believe it's any coincidence that Richard's involvement over the last two or three years, coupled with Luke's identifying of the talent to two coaches that had seen... So I'd been working with Jamie and Henry, for example, for five years before they before this year you know I've been working since they've been under 14s in a in a a pace bowling group that John Lewis had you know had set up or had asked me to sorry didn't set up asked me to be involved with five years ago whilst he was in charge so we've had these we've had these eyes on these players Sauls has seen Jack Carson seen Archie Lennon develop over the period of time so there is that connection and so things have aligned over this period of time but things change and Mike Yardy to build that mental resilience in these young players. Um, Charlie Tier, who's in the academy, he came up to Worcester, uh, was training with us with the first team. Bertie Foreman, um, indeed, was in the 12 up at Leicester in the final game of the year. You know, two very fine players already. So that's, you know, that's two out of the, the nine. Um, you know, there's a couple of youngsters that are real good, but they... they you know, their expectation is they think they can debut at 16 and 17 because they saw that happen in the last year or two. What the reality is, who knows? But it is exciting. Um, and what, you know, Richard will have left um, some values and thoughts of how a, an academy and how that pathway, um, what's important to that. And, and Michael will add to it, as we all will. And we will continue because the way that Sussex has to have as has to have as a model they have to they have to grow their own um, and we're passionate about that and that's why it's so important that we we are always looking you know yes we might be looking forwards but we've got to be looking at what's coming in behind um, our fine crop of players um, I'm mindful that time is, is nine o'clock. I hope everyone's still okay. I don't know if anyone wants a loo break or we'll just, we'll, we'll just carry on if everyone's quite happy there. I, I, I'll come to David in a minute. P Peter, I think you had another question, a follow-up question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'd just like to say that uh, I, I think most of us wish Ian and James um, success in the path that they've embarked on. But as with the comment that you made about Delray um, being judged by the numbers, that will also be true of the two of you. And um, the defence that you kind of made about um, Sussex playing brilliantly up until the six o'clock on the fourth day, I accept that would, would have been true, but that's a bit like, um, you know, in, in football management, if you were a premiership manager right now, um, you would probably be at the end of last season under a lot of pressure. And it's a bit say, like saying we, <laughs> we played brilliantly for the first 85 minutes, but then ultimately we lost. And you can only do that so many times. So obviously it's really important this coming season. And I stress again that there's clearly a lot of uh, goodwill for the two of you because of your lengthy playing careers here. And I think everybody would wish you to do really well. But ultimately, the team does have to win sometimes, um, more so than ha was the case, obviously, this last year. You, I, I just wanted to say, I, I imagine that you accept that that's the case. 
No, if we keep losing, I expect to be here for the next <laughs> five years. Um, yeah, but, but that's true. Of course it's true. Um, also, you like it to a premiership football manager. Um, often they get judged when they have their side that they put in place rather than inheriting sides and players. Sometimes in cricket that could take longer. Whereas in football, obviously, it's a bit clearer. It's like, whoop, whoop, off you go. And that could be backroom staff, players, off you go. You're not there until they get their side in and then they're judged more so on that. And that's cricket, you can't do that. that that's just a thing you can't do. I think, let's go, Ole, there you go. He's taken till now because he, he literally he took three years for him to get the side that he put together. And then as soon as it wasn't working, he was gone. But nothing happened before then because it wasn't his side. He was inheriting stuff from other people. So it's, I agree. Okay. Numbers. Thank you, Peter. Um, got another question, gentlemen, here in the second row. Thank you. I'm Graham. Hello, Graham. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on hitting the ball far. You don't get more than six when it crosses the boundary line. What I'm interested in you telling us is, and you've mentioned it in general terms with the um, coaching that you're doing, but the best batsmen are generally accepted to be Kane Williamson, Steve Smith, Joe Root, Virat Kohli. They are not predominantly six hitters. They're players that play with finesse. They play with their brain. <laughs> They're clever cricketers. How are you developing the skill set of Sussex cricketers to not necessarily emulate, but be a little bit smarter hitting the ball down <laughs> safely rather than hitting in the air with the associated risk with hitting it in the air? I think, look, I, I think what we have... Firstly, not many of the, the players have understood that... Uh, batting for a long time is actually a skill. So batting time is a skill. And I think we saw that in Ali Orr, who actually really did want to bat for a long time. And I think re reinforcing those views, those values, reinforcing that actually how mentally and physically tiring it is to do that, sometimes you, they, haven't, they haven't experienced what it is to face a first-class attack. So we have to try and emulate that, create that first and foremost. In terms of the technical bit, those are the, where the appraisals, those are where the, the hard conversations that, you know, whilst we might seem relatively lighthearted most of the time, and, you know, hopefully most of the time have a smile on our faces, we do have the hard chats. But they're being able to have the trust that that's being directed in the right way. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, going forward, we will have a big emphasis. We've seen proof in two players that I think um, were fine examples of that in, in Tom Haynes and in Ali Orr, who showed that if you were prepared to dig in, to prepare to put your ego aside, that there were runs to be scored. And I think when other players see that success, that is as strong as any comment a coach can make. Obviously, if there's a technical flaw, you have to intervene. But ultimately, there is just a deep desire to bat long and put a score on the board for the team. And hopefully, that obviously they, they played six games together at the end of the season and they had 300 partnerships between them, of which one of them was a double hundred. So that's evidence, potentially, of where we're trying to get them to go. Dan Ibrahim came in and faced a load of balls. So it is in... It's not that we're not telling them to do this. It's, it's easy to say, you should do this, and this is the way forward. I, I, you named some hell of a players there. <laughs> We'd love a few of those. But th they don't just grow on trees. These are the outliers, if, if you want my honest opinion. They're actual outliers. They actually don't, you know, Joe Root doesn't play T20 cricket. I'd be interested to see how much Virat plays going forward. Steve Smith, did he bat in the semi-final or final for them? Nah. You know, there's, there's forms, Labashain, you know, they, they didn't play. There are different types. We have our KPIs for our batters actually is on balls they face. So it's, it's not 
just on, trust me, it's not how many sixes they hit. Um, Tom Haynes, I think, finally hit a six. I think he was embarrassed that Archie Lennon had hit a six before him, so that's the only reason he did. <laughs> so he, it's not on his agenda. He just wants the bat time. That was the big thing that we, I had a chat with him. It was before Oval, the year before. He said, you don't hit enough balls, mate. He said, ask me simply, what, what do I do? We were at Blackstone, I remember he said, you know, how do I do? I said, you don't hit enough balls. He said, well, I don't get the opportunity to do it. I said, okay. Games at the Oval, about four days away, I'll be in every day. I can come in the morning, afternoon, I'll fling at you however many balls you want to hit. Funny if you remember, he scored 100. He did. And afterwards, you're going, sometimes cricketing gods can, or mother cricket can, give you the evidence straight away. It doesn't always work like that. Just because you hit a load of balls doesn't mean to say it automatically means you score runs. But it clicked with him, which then gave us the emphasis of how he did it in the winter. And it isn't about hitting sixes. There are some who want to hit sixes, obviously. But it's about... The only time you score runs is if you're in the middle. It's that simple. And so, yes, we are in stilling skills into them about batting time, scoring the runs that we need them to get. It is crucial. Absolutely crucial. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions in, in, in the room? Because uh, we've got a few questions that people have asked from outside the room. Sorry, there's a couple of... David. Thank you. My name's David Bowden. Um, James, I was re really pleased to see on one of your slides there the, uh, the name Becca at the Brighton Aldridge Community Academy. Uh, what we've heard of tonight is a, a stunningly good range of young cricketers coming through. Our congratulations to Richard and yourselves for achieving that. In addition, however, Baca is going to provide some of that talent in the future in a state school. And I'd be ever so grateful if you could both give a little bit of understanding about uh, the fact that there, I think, are going to be 75 youngsters there in, in two or three years' time. Uh, who, who will have cricket in their curriculum, um, uh, expert cricket tuition in their curriculum. That must be very good, mustn't it? And uh, that will add to the talent pool, hopefully immensely. Look, it, it, I, was, I was at Backer only the other week. Uh, young bowler, Frankie Cripps, uh, who's now on our academy, uh, has been someone that we've, we've ke kept an eye on. And uh, as you well know, it... it like we're saying, things in cricket take a bit of time, and I think Backer is just starting to see the the fruition of a an, an expertly um, set up facility. Um, it rivals anywhere, uh, probably in any education um, establishment in the country, and I think you know it will gain uh, momentum. You know the numbers, the people, uh, the players that it's attracting now and I've seen young club cricketers that I've been aware of um, now travelling from you know 15, 20 miles now to go to Baca I think is testament to to what is happening there. We're getting closer and tighter. I find myself I've found myself there more and more often um, and I think we will see more and more players not just uh, being a part of our pathway, but um, being part of the academy and going on um, to professional uh, into our professional squad. So, um, but you know, as, as Souls has said, you know, cricket does take a little bit of time to get a bit of momentum, and I'm sure Backer have had to be quite patient. And as you know, I, I was there from some of the early days. Um, it's great to see like I say, a player like Frankie starting to get the, the recognition that he should get. Thank you. Yeah, just on that, the, sure. so it was a massive part of Mike Yardis' presentation when he gave towards wanting to come back here. And I think Mike came from a state score. It's, it's something that he is passionate about. And if you've got somebody like that, it's, he's not going to leave any leaf unturned. He's going to make sure something happens. He's passionate about it. Gentleman behind you, uh, David. What's your name, sir? John Harrison. Thank you, John. Uh, this is to Ian. With following the re-signing of Finn and the signing of Finn, are we looking at uh, recruiting any more players before the start of the season? I'm not expecting names, 
Yes. If, if, um, if there are I think any in the pipe, darling. Can I just say, before you answer that, a, a very similar question from David Spurge. I don't know if David is here, who says, have you made any decisions yet upon next year's preferred overseas players? And have you made any attempts yet to recruit anyone? It's an ongoing, constant thing. <laughs> you have to be. like. It's something that, obviously, the cricketing world is quite hard to change because there's people out of contract and not out of contract. You get to find out who can be out of contract one year or when they're out next year. So there might be some we're looking at, but they won't be out of contract till maybe next year. There might be some who might be on loan. It, and as we were talking about lead, like recruitment, when we signed Travis and he agreed to it, there was two tours of being named since that happened. So then making recruitment a constant, you cannot take your finger off the pulse at any stage. So you, if anything, that probably takes up a lot of our conversation of, because you, you can't afford to, but also we don't want to get it wrong. And that's, I, the one thing, I, I don't want to make mistakes or cover up a mistake with another mistake. So it has to be, first and foremost, the right person. Like those two you said, the two fins, whether there was a shark fin in that, I don't know. <laughs> It was a pun there. A um, couple of laughs, I'll take it. You got more laughs today. Um, it was crucial, but they both wanted to come here, and that helps. And ironically, they're both out of contract. So there are two things that fitted the puzzle straight away. And so you're, you're constantly looking, but it has to be the right person. They have to want to play for Sussex and buy into what we're doing here. And the one thing is, we've got fantastic facilities here. Amazing ground. Obviously, the marquee we had up there, nets up there, the gym, the indoor school, the field, everything's in place. And it's a pretty decent place to live as well. So there is a lot of things to attract it. There might be people who might not come because of where we finished. If they don't get the bigger picture on where we're trying to go, they might say, look, Matt Critch is a good friend of mine. Would he have been a player who could have fitted in here? I would say yes. But he wanted to go to Essex. And there's nothing we can do about that. See, but are we asking questions? You can't ask illegal questions either, by the way. So you can't make approaches to people who are in contract. That's the whole point of having contracts. But you, with <coughs> Luke, and we're constantly looking at where our squad is, who we have in place, because we don't want to block people as well. But we also want to enhance people. But we're also, where, where are their holes? Where can we do? I had a, a guy ring me up today, he's an off spinner. I said, well, he's 23, wants to have a go. I'm like, I've got a pretty decent 20 year old off spinner at the moment. But then underneath him, I've got Bertie Foreman, who's literally come from the same school, Hurstby Point, and he wants to kick Carson out of the side already. So he's just started. But that's the sort of competition you want and the lineage of it that you want to create. How, we've got all these young fast bowlers. I just saw three fast bowlers tearing in because we did the academy induction on um, Sunday. I've seen Oli Carter come and I've seen him work so hard since he's, it's his first year as a pro cricketer, first winter. Then I've watched Charlie Tear because he played a couple of games going, I'm ready to play. So you, you try and create, but you're also looking for where you need to strengthen and where you don't. And that's ongoing, constant, all the time. Trust me, that's... But it's not always possible to get what you want. Because oh, no, you mentioned some names there. I, you know, if Kane Williamson, I, I, I don't mind at any stage. Steve Smith, I don't know. People might not want him, but whatever. But <laughs> Virat Kohli, if he's available. Whatever. But then I remember, oh, yeah, there's a competition called the IPL that happens in April and May, there's it, it, the landscape. Then they decide to have an IPL at the end of this season. Then they're now PSL, and then, it's, and then that's before they have a UAE one. So it's things that have changed all the time. It's not as simple as what it used to be. You know, when Courtney Walsh, Malcolm Marshall, all these guys would just pitch up in April and go home in September. It's so much simpler. Must take army, turn up April, go home in September. Such claim must take. Was you had them for a whole year with no interruption. It was I'm jealous of how easy potentially recruitment was in those days. 
Does that answer your question? Anyone else got a question in the room? If you've got anybody you think of, give us a shout. <laughs> if you, you uh, know. There was, a few, there was a few people who said they were going to ask a question. I don't know if they're in the room. So Mark, uh, Mark Vesey, Tim Cutress. No, a bit of a roll call here. I know Gary's already asked a question. But if, if, you, if you were going to ask a question, please, please do it now. Otherwise, I'll go to one or two of the questions that we got sent in advance. And uh, this was all about all format players. I know we've kind of discussed it, but this was a question from William who says, will the apparent policy of dividing players into white ball tournaments and those in red ball continue, or will the club try to prioritise players to play their part in all cricket forms? We, I think we're looking at that, that young crop, that we, we want them to play all formats physically. Sometimes that's not possible. Um, you know, we, we also want to keep that global brand. So we, we said we want to keep a high-profile side. Now, for that to happen, you have to have th that calibre of player. But we also know that the sustainable route is making sure you've got that from your young players. So you have to see, you have to have a balance in that way. Um, whether we prioritise, you know, Souls and I have many a discussion on who should play or who shouldn't play. But... Um, you know, we, we recognise it and that's why it, it might not always sit right, but we believe at times that we have to take player, ensure that players are rested in the best way that they could still perform for Sussex, whichever game they might turn up in. And, you know, that's resting on Ollie Robinson. And I remember coming onto the radio with Harmsey about, you know, the, the, the science and the, the, how important it was if, if we were going to get the sort of performances we wanted out of him we would have to rest him from time to time. And, you know, it's no coincidence that, you know, he suddenly rocks up at Glamorgan a little bit fresher than he might have been and takes the number of wickets he did. So, um, you know, we do we do have to ensure that players are at their, uh, at their best, best possible condition to perform. But we know that to have a sustained model of success, um, of course, we want our players. But it doesn't mean that they can't start their cricket either in the red ball and move to all formats or where a David Warner start in white ball and perhaps transfer to red ball. Yeah, 13 for 128 he took yeah. at Cardiff on a, on a flat deck. So that's pretty, that's pretty good. The dream is to have multi-format play. I think everybody wants to play in all formats. You know, I, I didn't turn up just wanting to play one format I was around. It's, if we, if we look at purely at the three youngsters, Dan Ibrahim, Archie Lennon, and James Coles. They're all at different stages. Ironically, Archie Lennon now T20 cricket. Him bowling four overs is perfect for where his body is at this present moment. He, if you notice he bowls at 55 mile an hour, that, that's good pace. If you're seeing there's, it's about that thick. He's literally skinny, but he's actually strong. Actually, four day cricket is really tough for him at the moment for his body and mentally, because he's 16 last year. It's really tough. And ironically, growing up, he's actually a batter who bowls leg spin. That's what we're forgetting. <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me if he ends up... So to get him, so it was important that he played a four-day game to get that experience. It was also the right decision to send him off and play some one-day cricket and play for England in the 19s. Because that you wouldn't want that on your CV. If you look at all the great cricketers that ended up playing for England or India, they've all played under 19 cricket. If we'd have played him in another four-day game and taken that under 19 chance away from him, he might regret that rest of his life, or it might affect things. But his body's not ready to play four-day cricket. Dan Ibrahim looks perfect for four-day cricket. But at the moment, he would be a long way away from playing T20 cricket. He's not as dynamic as he could be. We're talking about some people who strike naturally, say, in a one-day game at 80. If he tries to strike at 120 plus, he loses technique. And then his performance will go down. So it's the right thing for him to play in this calm tempo where he can face lots of balls, where his biggest skill has been able to leave the ball. And James Cole's similar. He's mainly a batsman who bowls left arm spin. But he made his biggest impact in white ball 50 over cricket. He was our best white ball bowler of the tournament. But he's mainly a batter. 
but he's not suited to T20 <coughs> either at the moment. But do they want to play in all three forms? Yes, they do. 100%. Um, one more question here um, from Colin and a similar question from Paul Gosswies. Uh, what is the club's policy to the racism that has happened at other counties? And I, I guess it's your, your own view, guys, of the, the, you know, the last three or four weeks that have what's happened in the game. Oh, look, as a, as a society and as a club, you know, it is... It is an anti-discrimination environment, and I think it sometimes can be, as it's not to underplay it, but actually to keep it as simple as that, actually probably delivers the the strongest of message. So mm. totally agree. It's yeah challenging for everybody now, and it, if it all we hope is good comes out of it from everybody involved in the game, but I think in society as well. If it just makes us think before we talk or what we say, I believe that's never a bad thing. And just be, as we, just, if we treat people how we want to be treated ourselves, that's not the worst place to be. If we naturally have empathy, that's not the worst place to be. But don't judge people when you haven't walked in the, you know, in the shoes of another man or woman. So I would, yeah, it's, um, anti, definitely. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Anybody? We don't want anybody to walk out tonight thinking I didn't ask that question or I'm not clear about the strategy that uh, Ian and James have outlined uh, this evening. Um, okay, well, I think we've answered all the questions. If there's anybody watching and your question hasn't been asked, I think the guys have pretty much answered everything in, in different formats. So thank you both for your time. Thank you all for coming out on a very cold night. And uh, I just I, add, I, can I just, sorry, just to add one more thing, we are accessible. We do walk around the boundary. We will come, you know, please don't ever hesitate. And thank you for coming out. Yeah, no, well. thank you for coming out. But we please appreciate don't ever it's hesitate. November. Thank you for coming out and your support. We, we are aware. Thank you. And we'll see you in April. Yeah.